morning, everybody. Thank you for joining this session. I'm Keith Bigelow, and I want to share a couple of things with you today. First, I want to get into an example of artificial intelligence in healthcare and how we approached it and why we thought it was a problem worth solving. Second, I want to explain what about healthcare is different maybe than other industries. So why do we need a platform and an ecosystem for building algorithms? And then third, I thought I would show you some of the cuts and bruises that we got along the way. Uh, and then if we have any time at the end, I'm happy to take questions or take them after the session. So this is really what we, we want to cover. Uh, so this first chapter, in terms of why does precision health need artificial intelligence? Uh, and let's just start with the world population. So right as I submitted this talk back in May, 7.7 billion people uh, in the world. And if we look forward and say, hey, what's happening here? About 130 million newborns every year, about 350,000 newborns every day. So obviously our population is growing and the cost of treating and giving great health care to this population is growing. And if we move forward a little bit, what I'd like you to do is imagine somebody that you know, and if you don't know anybody, think of your own mother, that just found out that they're pregnant. And if you are of Asian descent or African descent or of American descent or anywhere else, I'm gonna show you that this is a big deal not just because it's your baby, but because it's a challenge. So let's use India as an example. In India, there are 74,000 babies born every day. But 50,000 of them are born in rural areas. So more than two thirds. And why this matters is because at the 20 week level, when it's time for a women's health ultrasound to see how is this baby developing? Is this baby healthy? Does the mother need to change any of her behaviors or have intervention to help her have a healthy, beautiful child? It's actually hard. These sonographers, uh, their training varies, and the skill of capturing a great image of the baby's head to understand that baby's health is challenging. And so what you want for your friend who's about to have a child, who knows they're gonna have a child, is a great sonographer so that they can capture a great image and let that mother know, hey, don't worry, or Oof, we need to work with you. So what does this mean from a problem statement perspective? Uh, the most important thing that I would call your attention to here is actually on the far right of this slide. Why do we need artificial intelligence? Because there are 130 million babies born a year. 50,000 of those in rural India was my example. And yet we have this problem where 4% of all births have some type of central nervous system challenge. And the question is, do I have a good enough sonographer to get a good enough picture of my baby? Well, I'm not gonna have a baby. Uh, your friend's baby to know whether or not they're in the lucky 96 or in the challenging 4%. And if you look at these statistics for India alone, what you see is the likelihood of that rural woman getting a great ultrasound is really low, which means that if she needs intervention for her child, she probably won't get it. And if she gets scanned, she may get a poor quality scan. So our dream here is for all of these babies, how do we de-skill that 20 week ultrasound? How do we make it so that more of the people available in her rural community can perform this scan? How do we make it so that she knows successfully whether or not she has a health issue or not for her child? Our answer to this is an algorithm. This algorithm tells the sonographer where to put the probe. They don't have to know. They don't look at the monitor and guess. The monitor actually is guided for the probe exactly where it needs to be. And then what does it do? Well, once we have a perfect image capture, the next thing we wanna do for this ultrasound is start measuring the volume of the fetal brain. Why? Because this is where we're gonna see these central nervous problems, right? So as we kind of go through here, the algorithm will actually make all of the measurements for us. 
so that we don't have to waste time, in this case about 41 keystrokes, trying to do these individual measurements. The algorithm does that, and it's the same every time. So not only do we de-skill by putting the probe exactly where it needs to be and getting a perfect image every time, but we de-skill on the measurements. And now we can enable much better healthcare around the world. And you're like, great, Keith, you already solved this problem. This is a 510K cleared algorithm. Go home and party. Yes, except for a challenge, which is if you think across all of the parts of your anatomy, and you think about all the physics of healthcare devices, X-ray, MR, CT, ultrasound, the example I just gave, there are thousands and thousands of algorithms that we need. So we need a platform, because if you think about this, just chess, X-ray, think of that intersection on this, 800 plus medical conditions are captured in that little intersection. And that doesn't include all of the ologies, it doesn't include the omics, so there's many, many more layers than this simple chart from Bib Allen and Keith Dreyer just for radiology. So this is a massive problem space. We call it an infinite space of algorithms that we can go create to improve the lives of people across those 7.7 .7 billion lives. And I started with India, but it's not just an India problem. So I'll take you through this for the United States. If you were to need to go to the hospital and have some scan done, and you're in an urban area, you're really lucky because you have about one radiologist for every 10,000 citizens that are here in the US. And if we expand this out and just look around, well, there are 48 million people in Kenya, and the ratio is one to 240,000. So when you think about the number of algorithms that are required, you also have to think about the challenge of do we have people to actually read these scans that we're doing, and can they read them well? And the answer is often not. And now for those of you who live in the US, uh, get ready. So the Washington Post just published this article about three weeks ago that 46% of rural hospitals here in the US uh, are not making money. You look on the right-hand side of this slide, that means 400 hospitals in rural communities are imminent risk of collapse. So now we think about a growing population. We think about the challenge of all these conditions we need to understand and, and be able to interpret. And now we think about the cost pressures that are crushing into all of the hospitals that we go see. And it comes down to a really simple equation of constraints. We have a massive issue on costs. We have a massive issue on access. We have a massive issue on timeliness, because if we don't have a radiologist to read right now, and it's a critical condition, maybe you die in the night. Maybe I die in the night, because something was missed. And then finally, cost. How do we manage this growing population and yet still give them great health care? So this is why we set out to build a platform to try and address all of these constraints. And our platform is Edison. Edison is built on Amazon Web Services. It's also a local appliance that we deliver to market as well. And the idea is that we gather in information from all the hospital systems, we curate it, we percolate it into intelligence, and then we inject it into our devices and workflow applications inside the hospital. So this is our platform that we created to try and address this huge challenge. And if you go into great, so how did you build this platform precisely? Sorry, I'm just having a delay there, there we go. How we manage this for each and every algorithm that we create, and remember that massive landscape of algorithms that we want to go after. Well, first we begin with relationships with great hospitals. And working with them, we take a scan and we take the report for that scan, so think you had a chest x-ray and they're looking for pneumonia, we join them, then we de-identify them, and then we upload them into our Edison cloud. Why do we do that? Well, once it's ingested into our system, we can catalog the data, we can secure it, we can make sure that the right people have access to it and they know in the contract that we have with that hospital how we can use that data for research or for commercialization, et cetera. Once we have enough volume, we can move forward to curation. 
depending upon your industry, this may or may not be a huge issue. In healthcare, it's a massive issue. What we need to do is make sure that if we have your scan and we have a report for you, that report sure as hell better be right. So we'll actually show that report and scan to other clinicians to make sure that we start to get to ground truth. And we will mark exactly where, for example, these challenges are uh, in the scan in terms of we found a collapsing lung, we found a lung nodule, and we'll curate it with pixel level annotation to make sure that we have ground truth. And once we have that ground truth, we're ready to train. And we train, and we train. We often train initially on lower end Amazon instances, and then when we're winnowing down to the model that's really working for us and we want to get into hypertuning, then we'll switch over to P3 instances, for example. Our data scientist team really enjoys that flexibility from just kind of general exploration to narrowing and performance tuning. Finally, we get to deployment. So when you think of deployment, think of that woman in India. Think of a friend that came from Africa. The first deployment that we're thinking about is make this inferencing for this algorithm available in the cloud. So algorithm as a service so that no matter where you are, you can get the very best care. The second one is, can we deploy this to an edge device that's inside the hospital that's connected to all of the devices? And if we can, well, then we can do inferencing on all those devices for all the conditions that we know. Finally, in the bottom right, we can embed the algorithm directly into the medical device. We can do this with X-ray, we do it with MR, we do it with ultrasound, as I showed you earlier all with the idea of making that point of care experience better. So now you're thinking about your industry and you're trying to think, where does it matter in my industry where I deploy my model? Well, for us, if it's real time, point of care, it's got to be in device. If it can have a minor delay, and this is five, 10 seconds, put it on the edge. And if it can be tomorrow, of course the cloud is great. And the cloud is not always tomorrow, don't get me wrong. But you can think in terms of latency and the volume of data. If I have many, many gigabytes that I have to upload, I'm not going to get an instant inference on my particular scan. So we pull this forward. Great. Now we know that there's an infinite problem space of algorithms. We know that we desperately need those to go cure and take care of 7.7 .7 billion people. How do we build them? And this is one of our lessons learned that I would share with you. Start with your teams on your values and principles and make really sure that those principles reflect who you're creating algorithms about, in our case, patients. What is your duty to those people? In our case, a lot. Our, our reputation and brand is standing on the quality of these algorithms and how well we create them, how well we protect the privacy of patients. Uh, but spend a lot of time on this with your team, and then create checklists to make sure that you actually follow them. There's a great book by DJ Patil. Uh, it's on O'Reilly, it's free. You can download it from Amazon or anywhere else. And it goes through all of the data science checklists that you should have, and it's almost like he wrote this book for healthcare. It talks to privacy, it talks to unintended consequences and intended use. Make sure that you're thinking through that as you build this out for your team and your customers or whomever is the object of your algorithm. <clears throat> so I, I figured it'd be worthwhile to explain a couple more algorithms and what we're trying to do with them and how we deploy them. So in X-ray, if you are having any type of surgery or you've already had surgery and now you're in recovery, a portable X-ray is going to actually scan your chest. The latest, uh, work that we're doing in x-ray is to try and detect critical conditions in the chest. So that if you have an issue right after surgery, we catch it while you're still in the ER. And we notify the care team. You notice there's a red light that flashes in the middle of the screen. Think about the user interface. This was a great part of the prior talk that just went uh, through with Capital One. You want to be as inintrusive, inobtrusive as possible with your AI. It should be invisible, but it should be present when it needs to be present. Catch the eyeballs of the team. In this case, we want to have the care team see this alert that someone's lung is collapsing, 
right at the point of care in real time as the scan is done. Not two minutes later when they've left the room when they maybe turn their eyes and they don't see what happened. So this is something that not only do we try and capture the care team's eyes and help them to see this so that we take care of you better, but we pass all of this decoration of the image into the PACS, which is kind of like the content management system at a hospital. So no matter what, all of this intelligence is gonna be preserved and follow the scans that we do. Now, how did we build this particular algorithm? Well, we started with data. Remember that path on ingesting data. And as you look at how you're going to build your algorithms, the volume of data that you have is super important. So what we found as we started to add more and more data to our corpus was that balanced data really matters. Look at row number two on this chart. Why does that matter? Because here we have a massive amount of unbalanced data. It doesn't do anything in terms of improving the performance of our algorithm. We have to have balanced data. So as you look at it, you may think you have a ton. Keith, I have 100,000 scans. Great. How many actually have the condition you're trying to catch? It doesn't help you if you have 100,000 scans and you have 50 that are positive. You're not going to get what you want from a really highly accurate model. So volume is important, but variety is super important. So remember I started with India. In India for a chest x-ray, the field of view is really wide. On the screen here you see an arm in the scan instead of just the pure chest. A pneumothorax is a collapsing lung. It means that you have an air bubble in your chest. When we started using data from India, we realized with this wide field of view, our algorithm was lighting up like crazy for all the people who were sit, standing like this to have their x-rays done. This is a problem of unintended correct observation of deep learning. Yes, good algorithm, you figured it out, there was an air pocket. No, you just raised a false alarm on thousands of x-rays that will really upset the care team. And they'll be like, I reject your algorithm, Keith, it stinks. So think variety, and in fact, we think variety is more important than volume. I'd rather have data from 10 hospitals in six countries, and it's only 10,000 scans, for example, than 200,000 scans from a single institution. You want to see the difference in practice of medicine. And for your industry, think that through. Does it matter where my data comes from? In healthcare, it does, not only geographically, but some of these scans that we used were from the emergency room. Why? Imagine you were just in a car wreck. They're gonna take your scan in whatever body position you're in as fast as possible to take care of you. They don't really care if you're perfectly positioned. Well, what does that mean for the quality of your algorithm if all these scans are, are all over the place from the emergency room? It means you have to have that data or you can't inference in that environment. So don't make the mistake of creating an awesome algorithm that only works in one tiny microcosm of the landscape that you need to serve. Which brings me to veracity. Um, and this goes back to your curation style and who's actually making sure that you have gold data and not crap data. Somebody sure as hell better be doing it. In our case, we find that radiologists actually differ in their perception in terms of is that a collapsing lung? Yes, no. So we have to go through and create ground truth, as I mentioned earlier, in terms of how we build algorithms. And we find that all those errors actually really undermine the quality of our algorithm. So why did we go to the, the difficulty of pixel level annotation, finding the exact lung nodule cancer, or finding the perfect spot where the lung is collapsing? because it trains the algorithm so much better. So you see here the combination of a positive label, yes, somewhere in Keith's chest is a positive finding for pneumothorax, collapsed lung, versus yes, there is one, and it's right here. Well, actually, it would be up here. So think about your curation types as you build your algorithms to make sure that you're investing the right balance. You don't have to pixel level annotate every single scan in the case of healthcare, you can do a balance of label annotation, yes, no, and then pixel level annotation right here. And we find that we get really great results by blending these. I think you will as well if you're working with images. 
if you have tens of thousands of algorithms that you need in healthcare, for example, you need to be humble and you need to realize you cannot solve this problem on your own. So when we built Edison, and you saw that it's built on Amazon and with the help of great partners uh, in our ecosystem of technology, we designed it with the idea of how do we work and capture all of the brilliance of startups in our market. So we want every single startup to thrive and be amazingly successful, because then we can catch their algorithm, drop it into Edison, and then drop it into our workflow applications and medical devices. And of course, when you think about your industry, there may or may not be startups that you want to partner with, but probably so. So be thinking in terms of how do I express a model API standard so that my partners can write to it so I can catch it. In the middle one here, our competitors are all trying to do the same thing. Not nearly as well. Um, I said humble, and then I said that, sorry. Um, but it is crucial that you think about what your competitors are doing from a platform perspective so that you're not taking this as a one-off and doing onesie-twosies if they're opening up a fire hose into their system because then you're just going to be wiped off the map. And then third, we have the, the real benefit, and I don't know if your industry does, of academic hospitals. These are the hospitals like Stanford, like UCSF, like Boston Children's, like Oxford, um, PHS, Partners Health in Boston, UCSD, all of our top medical institutions are creating algorithms right now. So we need to be able to enable them to create algorithms so that we can catch them and then deploy them into the fabric of the hospital wherever they need to go. So think of your industry and think of, hey, how should this work for me? So what have we learned? Uh, what cuts did we get? Um, anybody remember Buckminster Fuller and, uh, say, Jeffrey Hinton, some, some interesting luminaries? Jeffrey Hinton, in healthcare four or so years ago, said anybody who is training to be a radiologist is like the coyote over the cliff, doesn't even know it. So basically saying all your jobs are at risk. So bullet one, be really aware of, are algorithms going to freak out your customers? So the early way that algorithms in healthcare were presented to healthcare clinicians was, you don't have a job anymore. You're out of a job. We don't need you anymore. Great way to build support in the industry, right? Um, so be thoughtful of that as you're introducing it. What we actually realized, and I'm sure you've heard this in many, many talks, is that the algorithm is it's the angel on the shoulder that's helping your team. It's not replacing people, it's just making them better. And you're gonna keep raising the mean inside your organization with the more algorithms that you equip your teams with. Number two, if you are in financial or healthcare or other heavily regulated industries, get in front of it. Start working with the FDA or any regulatory body that you work with and help to write these rules, not because you're evil and you're gonna make it so that you can destroy everyone and rule the world, but because you're probably more informed or as informed as anybody else in helping to shape what the regulatory environment should be. In healthcare, an algorithm is a medical device. And for each and every algorithm I showed you, we bring it to the FDA for FDA approval. And we have to show them that path of volume and variety and veracity for them to trust that indeed this is a great algorithm. But we think we're helping the FDA in advancing this cause. And so I would really encourage you, figure out who your standards bodies are and engage with them. Number three, and I hope you've heard this in every talk as well, algorithms are not necessarily products. In fact, I don't think they are. I think they're features of products which means that you need to understand, are your customers going to pay for these things? And if they're not, you sure as hell better choose them really carefully in terms of which ones you organically invest in. Um, my favorite use case here that you can steal and use broadly in your company as well is, are we building a seatbelt, which in 1960 was novel and did not come in all cars, it was an add-on that you paid for, but is now free. Are we building ABS braking? 
We paid extra for that, but now it's free. How many other things, when you think about your own industry as you're creating all this incredible differentiation right now, what is the effect of gravity and what's the duration of gravity for your innovation? I think in AI, it's super short. So you can compete like crazy, especially if you're in an unregulated industry, run and show your brilliance of innovation. If you're in a highly regulated industry, by the time you get it to market, how close is it to seatbelt? How close is it to something that's free? So Volvo taught us that you can create a brand out of safety. They were the first to put seatbelts in, ABS braking, all sorts of great things, airbags, and they standardized it. So as you think about your brand, now think packaging, this fourth bullet. Maybe you'll have base and maybe you'll have premium and you'll put your algorithms in premium so that you can monetize them. The way you have trim levels on a Ford car, titanium is the best, right? Well, it is for Ford. Um, but you can do that, good, better, best, and start to allocate algorithms in your packaging. You don't directly monetize them, but you drive spend to a premium product. In the case of Volvo, they said, no, 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 no. Our brand is safety. So it'll be in every car. What is your brand? That should drive your packaging and your expectations on monetization. Finally, um, I did my first machine learning acquisition at Salesforce in 2012, and we brought on a brilliant team of young individuals, data scientists. It was not my finest hour from an organization perspective because I didn't realize how different these animals are. They are a new tribe in your company. And we heard in the opening keynote about, oh, you know, we used to centralize our data scientists and then we sent them out like the diaspora. Awesome. Don't send them out until you have a lot of them because they need to feel like they're part of a flock. They, it's a new role. Trust me, your HR team actually needs to get bought into their comp structure, which is awesome. They make a lot of money. Um, but also their career pathways, because they're not like engineers or product managers or what have you, quality engineers. And if you don't create a career path for them, they'll walk to a company that will. So where are we right now in our learning? We have a center of excellence. This is where we do our research. This is where we do our advanced technology projects that can be several iterations out. And this central team of product data science that we have is bootstrapping teams and helping them to build this muscle inside their own org. But we didn't do that on day one. On day one, we had a small central team that just locked arms with each and every team to deliver value. So I would strongly suggest if you don't have a big team, keep them together, show them that you care about them, nurture that community, and then as you scale, by all means, embed them in all of your product teams. And that's going to give you what you need. So that's what I wanted to share. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm a huge fan of Bucky Fuller. You have to think about how you're going to rewrite the rules for your industry. Everybody's going to try and block you, <laughs> be it regulatory or some management structure, what have you. This is your opportunity to change it. Just own it. Make the old model obsolete. And that's why we're here. That's why we're at this event. Please reach out to me on email. Send me a note on Twitter or LinkedIn. Would love to catch up with any of it and all of you. Thanks so much.